But let me officially introduce you. This is Ann Margaret Smith, and she is an inclusive English teacher and trainer, dyslexia assessor, author, and researcher. She founded ELT Well back in 2005. And the great news is that Ann Margaret is going to be one of the plenary speakers along with Marjorie Rosenberg at the 26th Annual International Conference. So you're busy. From Macedonia Thrice. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Congratulations. Pretty excited about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we're going to hear more from Maria about that at the end, but uh, that's great. And I hope everybody can make it to the conference. And hopefully by then I'll have shaved, okay? So, <laughs> you, but can I just say, Rob, you look very handsome today. Oh, why, thank you. I was going to type it in. I thought, no, no, I'll say it personally to you. <laughs> you can type it in too, so it's in writing, because nobody will believe it. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Okay, so I got the timer ready. You've got control, and thanks for being here once again. And take thank you. So thank you for the invitation to join in this great event, and thanks to Corey for kicking us off. And it's almost like we planned it. I'd like to go take you back to Corey's first slide and uh, remind you of that negative cycle where students are perhaps having difficulty, don't like reading, don't do it much, don't get any better. Because actually, what we're asking students to do is quite complicated. And I want to talk today about how we can untangle the knot of reading. Some of us who have gone into teaching perhaps didn't have too many difficulties getting started with reading, um, but that might make it more difficult for us to understand what's going wrong for some of our learners. It's quite complex what we're asking them to do. If you look at this diagram here, you can see that we need to look at the words and understand the individual words. We need to see how the words hang together in a sentence so that the meaning from the sentence comes out. But then all the sentences have to also make sense in the overall text so that we get the overall message from the author. There's a lot going on. And that's before we ask students to read out loud and start articulating as well. I'm not going to talk about that today. But what I'd like to do is just go through these steps and think about where the barriers might be and also very briefly suggest what the solutions could be. Um, I've only got nine, uh, eight and a half minutes now. So obviously it's going to be a bit of a brief overview. So when we're talking about individual words, we need to recognize um, that each letter will represent a sound. Now, we know that in English, it's not always one to one like that. That's a barrier in itself. And what we might need to do is help the student to do more practice on this kind of phonics work so that they understand what the options are. We need to separate the letters out so that when we see a word like nut, we can separate it out. So n, a, t, the sounds separately to free the sounds so that we can hear what's going on in the word. Then, of course, we need to put the sounds back together. So n, a, t becomes n, a, t, n, a, t, nut. That way we can actually find out what the word is. So this is a little bit of phonics practice that we could do with students. That might be difficult for some students, but practice, practice, practice always makes perfect. Once we've got the word, then we need to retrieve the meaning. That could be a barrier in itself for some students who might have seen the word but not recognize it and not remember that they've seen it. So having an image like Mr. Nutt here could be helpful for some learners. Of course, there are some words in English that that won't work. <laughs> Phonics won't work for every word in English. There are some words, actually quite a lot of high frequency, very common words that we just have to recognize like as if it's like a picture. Just some examples here. You can't separate out s e and get she. You can't separate out t and get the. There's no way. You just have to know that that's she and the. And although they look very similar, they don't sound alike. The same with the words underneath. We've got a, s, us. That's OK. That works. But unfortunately, it won't work with as or is because we say as and is. The students just have to recognize these words. And that might take a lot of practice for some students whose visual memory is not strong. 
But again, we can practice and we can help them and we can find games and fun ways for them to keep repeating until they start to get it. So that's individual words. What we could also do is help students to recognize some of the spelling patterns in English. Maybe not rules. Rules is too strong a word, but patterns that they will see again and again. For example, the power E pattern, very productive. When you have a word with a short vowel, if you add an E on the end, all the power from the E goes to that short vowel and makes it stand up and say its name. So instead of having fat with a, you have fate with a. You don't hear the E because all the power has gone to the other vowel. The same with the double consonant pattern. When you have um, a short vowel followed by a consonant, could have a consonant at the beginning or double consonant at the beginning. If you add a suffix that begins with a vowel, you double that last consonant to keep the vowel short. So that's something that students might find helpful to, to start spotting um, so that when they come across unfamiliar words, um, they will know that it's not sliming, it's slimming, not slimed, but slimmed. Those sorts of patterns we can point out to students and help them with the decoding of, of words. Let's move on, though, to sentence. So when we've identified what the individual words are, we need to know how they hang together. And we need quite a lot of grammatical knowledge in order to make sense of the relationship between the individual words. So here, for example, I've already spotted that this sentence starts with do. So I'm thinking, OK, that could be a question. Now, I, I can do that because I'm a fairly competent reader of English. But some students might not spot that. They might need that pointing out to them. They might need to do some practice in spotting what kind of a sentence is it. Then they might need some help with other punctuation marks. So here we can see that the question mark confirms this is indeed a question. In order to clarify some of the possible ambiguity here, the apostrophe is also really important. So when we say, do you know her sister's husbands? We need to know, does she only have one sister with several husbands or is it several sisters, each with just one husband? I mean, we don't know, we can't make assumptions. So the apostrophe is really helpful here to show us exactly how many sisters there are uh, and therefore how many husbands they might have. Students might need some extra training with punctuation. And I think that's something that often gets neglected something that we could definitely do to help our students. Moving on to the whole text then, how do these sentences hang together to give the message overall? There are clues throughout texts. Most authors will use cohesive devices to give us clues about the connection between the ideas. Now, for example, in that in that last sentence, we had her, her sister's husband. Who is her? So we need to think back and think, was there a female person mentioned that we are now calling her? Or there might be some time expressions like first, next, then. This will help us to follow the narrative through. But this does take quite a lot of working memory. And this could be a big barrier for some students whose memories are not strong and who quite easily get overwhelmed with trying to remember a lot of information. So they might need some help with developing working memory. So spotting the cohesive devices, but then also remembering what's gone before so that they can use that previous information to process the new information as they read it. That's a big ask for some students. But perhaps the hardest thing, and I think for many students, the hardest thing is um, understanding the writer's intention. So we might understand the individual words, we might understand the grammar of the sentence, but when we try and think, what is the actual message? What we need to do is try and get underneath the vocabulary and the grammar and look at the whole big picture, thinking about why these words, why in this order, what would happen if we changed the order or changed the words? And it might be that the writer comes across as having a very positive and benign message, but actually, if you look really closely, you might see that the intention could be a little bit sinister, a little bit negative. And this is the basis of critical reading. And this is something that I know our students find really quite challenging. And particularly, I think, to do in a second language when you need a lot of cultural background as well. Asking ourselves, what's the agenda? And how could we evaluate the quality of this text? Is it actually a nice, clear, positive text? 
or is there something that's a bit confusing and maybe it's not me that hasn't understood but maybe the text isn't really clear and I think if we can encourage our students to to start taking a more holistic approach like that we can help them with their their critical reading and their holistic understanding of the text but finally I just want to come back to the idea that reading is it's very complex what we're asking people to do right from uh, looking at the individual words putting the words into sentences or understanding the words in sentences but then looking at the whole and trying to get the whole message from them there's a lot going on this is why i think it's so important that as teachers we try and unpick what the barriers are for our learners where exactly is the challenge because then we begin to understand our learners better even if we haven't been through that ourselves, and I think, as I say, a lot of teachers perhaps didn't experience those difficulties. If we can try to understand what our learners are going through, then we can decide what is the most appropriate support. Do we need to work on the, the phonics? Do we need to work on the sight words? Is it the grammatical connection in the sentences? If we start to support them, they begin to succeed in reading. And this is where we come back to Corey's little diagram. When they start to succeed, in reading that's when they begin to enjoy it and we know that when we enjoy doing something we do it more and when we do it more we improve so this is what we're aiming for going to stop there and say thank you very much for listening and i'm looking forward to seeing what other people have got to say on this topic <laughs>